Well, why don't we get started today? Sorry, I just got a big message on my screen. Um, welcome to uh, Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, we will always start our Grand Rounds with a land acknowledgement. So Ottawa is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived in, on this territory for millennia, and we honor them and this land. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. CHIO also honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land. It's my pleasure today to uh, introduce our speaker for Grand Rounds, who is a stranger to no one, but, uh, but there's some new people here. So maybe this will be your introduction to the amazing Dr. Leanne Ward. So Leanne is a professor in the Faculty of uh, Medicine, and she is a Tier 1 Research Chair in Pediatric Bone Disorders. As Alex McKenzie just said, she is your go-to person if you have any challenges with any bone-related um, osteoporosis, any type of issue. Leanne is uh, truly the world expert for it, and we're so fortunate to have her at CHEO. And she is going to speak to us today about a bio biological principles-driven approach to the diagnosis and management of secondary osteoporosis in childhood. Thank you, Leanne. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I'll just load these slides. Can everybody see? Are we good here? Thumbs up, Donna? Sorry, it looks great. I didn't know I was muted. Yes, it looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, I'm on Mariana's sort of, you know, call tree to reach out to if there's a hole in the grand round schedule. And so she reached out a few weeks ago and said she had a little bit of a space. So I'm filling in here and I'm talking to you today about secondary osteoporosis. Just want to acknowledge the funding sources for the work that you'll hear about today, largely CIHR and PSI for this particular work. And these are my disclosures. I do partner with industry with funds to my institution. We're working together to develop novel bone and muscle therapies for children with rare disorders. And all of the osteoporosis therapies that you'll hear about today are currently off-label in children. We still do not, after all these years, have an on-label Health Canada-approved osteoporosis therapy for children, and that's a huge unmet need. So I have four main objectives. I'd like to discuss a stepwise approach to the diagnosis and the management of secondary osteoporosis, an approach that's based on clinical biological principles. So what I wanna do is walk you through the way we think as bone health physicians when we see children with serious acute and chronic illnesses that put them at risk of fractures. I'll summarize the results of recent clinical trials that have refined our understanding of the best candidates for an optimal treatment of chronic diseases at risk for bone fragility. Also talk about a vision for the future of bone health care at CHEO in children who are at risk for secondary osteoporosis. And in so doing, I'm going to highlight ways in which you as general pediatricians and trainees and subspecialists can contribute to the optimization of bone strength in our CHEO children. Now, I was just saying to Don and Alex that you're, you're my toughest audience because you're so varied in your backgrounds. And so I had to really sit back and think about how I could deliver something that would leave each and every one of you with something to think about irrespective of your backgrounds. And so I hope I've done that today. I wanted to start with a 50 foot view of the kinds of disorders that we see in the CHEO tertiary care bone disorders clinic. And we certainly see children with rickets, nutritional and genetic, osteoporosis primary, meaning due to an underlying genetic disorder or secondary due to a chronic disease or its treatment. That's what I'm talking about today. Ultra rare mineralization disorders, both under and over mineralization, various skeletal dysplasias, as you can see here, inflammatory bone disease. And we also contribute to non-accidental injury assessments to make sure that the child does not actually have an underlying bone fragility condition. So I specifically chose secondary osteoporosis today, which is when the underlying disease or its treatment put the child at risk of bone fragility because it is so applicable to a broad general pediatrics audience. I just wanna really remind you what osteoporosis is. Osteoporosis means holes in the bone or a paucity of bone. It's very different than rickets and osteomalacia. And our first step is always to distinguish between the two. In osteoporosis, the bone is mineralized. So we can't use terms like demineralization of the bones or undermineralized. That bone is mineralized. There's just not a lot of it. 
bone is either being whittled away or it, not enough is being formed. Whereas in rickets and osteomalacia, there's a buildup of unmineralized bone that's like pudding. It's called osteoid, shown in red there. And that also puts the patient at risk of fractures, but it's a totally different etiology. So today we're focused on osteoporosis. Now there's a long list of disorders that are associated with secondary osteoporosis, and these are the main ones. Malignancy, inflammatory disorders, any condition that takes a child off their feet, either temporarily or permanently, can put them at risk of bone fragility with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and CP being the flagship disorders. And then glucocorticoids and other medications can be osteotoxic, with steroids being extremely osteotoxic, especially if given at high doses over the long term. Endocrinopathies on their own, delayed growth and puberty, usually are markers of the severity of an underlying disease and rarely drive bone fragility all on their own unless severe and unrecognized. So I'm going to take you through now these biological principles that map out for you how we think as bone disease clinicians in order to help us diagnose and understand how to manage these patients with chronic illness osteo porosis and risk factors for bone fragility. In the course of doing that, I'll talk about clinical manifestations and predictors of secondary osteoporosis, how we monitor the at-risk population. This notion of uh, medication unassisted recovery, sometimes we don't have to treat, and how do we know which children we don't have to treat, and then treatment strategies for those who do have limited potential for recovery. I also just want to remind you what the elements of skeletal health are. So we sort of toss around the term bone health or skeletal health, which is about as specific as fever to the infectious disease consultants. Bone health really means bone strength, and that's determined by bone growth in length and width, volumetric BMD, so bone density in grams per centimeter cubed, bone shape, bone tissue quality, as well as bone metabolism or bone activity. And you can see that bone density is just one aspect of the determinants of bone strength. So you have to keep in mind that this is a three-dimensional structure. We try to measure it with a two-dimensional DEXA, which is a weak surrogate for bone strength. And the skeleton is ultimately adapting to mechanical challenges. Depending on those mechanical challenges, you get very different skeletons, as you can see here. So clinical biological principle number one is that the mechanostat model of bone strength development in childhood provides a foundation for understanding the mechanisms of bone fragility in children with secondary osteoporosis. And this mechanostat model I use in my mind every time a child with a risk factor for chronic illness osteoporosis comes through my door. So I wanna share it with you. So what drives bone strength in childhood? It is not calcium and vitamin D. Calcium and vitamin D do not ignite, catalyze, or drive bone strength development. It's mechanical challenges on bone that ignite the bone strength cascade. And those mechanical challenges are increases in bone length and muscle forces. They cause bone tissue deformation or bone tissue strain, which is sensed at a genetically determined set point by the master bone cell, the osteocyte, and then the osteocyte sends signals to the osteoclast to resorb damaged bone from tissue strain. And then the osteoblasts move in and they lay down new bone at the site of tissue strain to maintain bone strength close to the genetically determined set point in the face of ever increasing mechanical challenges of childhood. And then estrogen lowers the set point, so you don't need as much of an osteogenic stimuli to set off the cascade. And nutrition is important because calcium and phosphate are necessary to form the crystals that mineralized bone once it's been laid down by the osteoblast. Now, how does this go awry in chronic illness? Well, in chronic children, illness, children lose their mechanical challenges to varying degrees. They don't grow well. They can have muscle weakness. And so there's a lack of bone tissue strain and a lack of strain that is being sensed by the osteocyte. So the osteocyte doesn't have much to do when there's lack of mechanical forces on bone. 
as well as glucocorticoids, which are highly toxic, they stun the osteocyte so that it doesn't sense bone tissue strain very well. They rev up the osteoclast inappropriately, at least in the beginning of their exposure, and then ultimately the osteoclast goes to sleep. And that's bad because then you lose the ability of the skeleton to repair itself at sites of bone tissue strain. Osteoblasts are also dampened by glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids delay puberty. They cause hypercalciuria and renal phosphate losses, and they increase vitamin D catabolism. So there's a lot going on here that can bring about loss of bone strength. And when I see a child in clinic, again, I literally go through this model and I try to identify the elements of the model that are being adversely affected by the chronic illness or its treatment. Now, is why is weight bearing such an important aspect of bone strength development? Every time a child runs, jumps, plays, weight bears, walks, bone undergoes this deformation, which is a good thing. It's sensed by the osteocytes represented by the circles as changes in fluid flow within the canaliculi of bone. And then the osteocytes send those signals to the class and the blast to reinforce bone at the site of tissue strain. Now, when you lack normal bone tissue deformation because of degrees of lack of weight bearing, then you see very overt problems with the bone. This is a boy with Duchenne on the left, and you can see that the bone density is low on the x-ray, and the cortices are thin here at the femur. You can also see a little fracture, but you also can see that the bone has not grown normally in width, and small bone size and periosteal circumference or cross-sectional diameter is an independent risk factor for fractures, and this is why children with neuromuscular disorders are so profoundly at risk for fractures, as is any child that's taken off their feet. Now, the relationship between glucocorticoids and fractures is indisputable. This is a nice study, again, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, showing a linear relationship between glucocorticoid duration and fracture probability, such that after about seven years of glucocorticoids, about half of the patients will have had at least one long bone fracture. And after about eight years of steroids, we would expect almost all patients with Duchenne to have had at least one vertebral fracture. This is a nice montage because it shows you just how different the bone looks depending on the underlying disease. On the left, this is a boy with high risk ALL who had high dose steroids to treat the leukemia and put it in remission. And he just has very little bone, period. And then the child with the neuromuscular disorder has very thin bones or grass cell bones. The bone that's there is denser, but the overall bone density is going to be lower compared to a healthy child by DEXA because there's just so little bone and cross-sectional diameter. So the bone looks very different depending on the underlying disease. And together, these create a scenario where bones are more fragile. So when I see a child that you refer for secondary osteoporosis... What time is it? Oops, if you could put yourself on mute. I think it's a quarter to nine. <laughs> um, so I divide the risk factors for bone fragility into two groups, those that are modifiable and those that are not modifiable. So the ones that are non-modifiable, obviously I can't do anything about. We accept those as risk factors for bone fragility, like reduced mobility due to a myopathy or the need for steroids. And then there's the modifiable risk factors. And these are the ones that we target to make sure they're optimized in children with a history of a low trauma fracture. So if we can optimize mobility, we'll do that. If there's a way to tweak the steroids and get the patients on something that's steroid sparing, then the MRPs responsible for the disease will do that. Obviously, treatment of the underlying disease effectively is primordial. We'll address nutritional issues, treat delayed puberty and growth hormone deficiency. And I talk a lot about fall prevention in the clinic. So the mechanostat model forces me to think about everything that might be going wrong in the child to bring about bone fragility. Principle number two is that vertebral fractures are the hallmark of secondary osteoporosis in children. They can occur in any child who's unwell i.e. if a child has poorly controlled inflammatory disorders. We know that the cytokinopathy can rev up the osteoclasts and dampen the osteoblasts, for example, and mobilization is a major risk factor, as I've said. Now, the thing about vertebral fractures is that when they occur in children on steroids, they happen early. You don't have to have a long-term steroid exposure to have vertebral fractures. The vertebral fracture 
incidence correlates directly with the burden of glucocorticoid exposure, which is usually maximal in the first couple of years of the disease in many conditions like leukemia and inflammatory disorders. Now, the kicker is that vertebral fractures are frequently asymptomatic, even when moderate and severe. So we have to go looking for them with routine surveillance in those at risk. And know that both vertebral and non-vertebral fractures can occur at DEXA-based BMDZ scores better than minus two. So minus two for a BMDZ score is not the holy grail of clinical care. We do not hang our hat on any sort of a notion of a threshold because you can be fragile at a BMDZ score of better than minus two. Now, certainly the lower the BMD, the higher the fracture risk, but it's not black and white. It's on a continuum. So get rid of minus two as some sort of a holy grail bifurcation in the thinking. It just simply is not. Now, much of what we learned about vertebral fractures in children with chronic illnesses, we learned from the steroid-induced osteoporosis in the pediatric population or STOP study. This was a prospective longitudinal study of 500 children with leukemia, rheumatic disorders, and nephrotic syndrome, and we studied them around the time of steroid initiation for a total of six years in order to understand the natural history. And what we learned is that vertebral fractures are important, and they're important because they're associated with back pain, they're associated with kyphosis, loss of linear height, not just like with little old, you know, ladies with osteoporosis who get shorter, but children get shorter with vertebral fractures. And they can cause permanent premature loss of ambulation in patients with tenuous ambulation to begin with, like Duchenne. Now, in adults, vertebral fractures are also linked to back pain, kyphosis, and loss in linear height, but they further, on large cohorts, been shown to link to reduced lung function and excess mortality. And I think as pediatricians, we're behooved to make sure those vertebral bodies stay as tall as possible during childhood, because once you finish growing, you cannot modify the height of the vertebral body. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Vertebral fractures are so important that we need to be talking about them in a standardized way. And we validated the Jeanette semi-quantitative method to define vertebral fractures in children, which are defined as more than 20% loss in vertebral height ratio. So here's an example of what vertebral fracture prevalences and incidences look like in a flagship disease. This is in leukemia. And you can see right off the bat, the vertebral fractures are more common than long bone fractures. And that's true in all of the secondary osteoporotic conditions of childhood. You can see that most of the vertebral fracture burden is in the first two years, and that aligns with when the children receive most of their steroids. And then you can see that the fracture rates go down as the child comes off their steroids and becomes well. However, there's a little blip between four and five years post leukemia diagnosis when both vertebral and long bone fractures go up. They're off their chemo at this point. So what's going on? Well, when you come off steroids as a child, you grow more rapidly, but there's a lag between growth and densification of bone. And so this is a true period of bone fragility. And I counsel kids after they finish their leukemia chemotherapy to rebuild their constitution and their strength before they start hitting the ski slopes like they did before treatment. Here's some examples of verbal fractures. In leukemia, we saw a 16% prevalence of diagnosis and a 32% incidence over six years. We have a grade one fracture on the left and a grade two in the middle and a grade three or severe vertebral fracture on the right. Now, this is an example of what we can see in rheumatic disorders. This is a seven-year-old girl with an overlap syndrome. She had a beautiful spine at baseline pre-steroid and then she had back pain four months after starting steroids. In that four months, she became floridly Cushingoid, and Cushingoid features are a risk factor or a clinical signature of risk for fractures. And so if you are following patients who are Cushingoid, you must be looking at their spine x-ray for vertebral fractures. So her BMI Z score went up by plus three. She developed a round face, her height Z score went down, and her spine BMD Z score went down. And then she had these grade one and two vertebral fractures. So vertebral fractures are important in the secondary osteoporosis context, and we need to go looking for them because they're frequently asymptomatic. Now, biological principle number three focuses on long bone fractures. 
And what I want you to remember is that even a single low trauma long bone fracture can be a sign of osteoporosis in an at-risk child. You do not need multiple low trauma long bone fractures to say you have a problem. And here's an example. This is a patient with Duchenne who had a tibia fracture at six years of age, had orthopedic fracture management, went home, never came to a bone health monitoring clinic, showed up seven years later, spine is completely collapsed on steroids. And the kids don't grow well on steroids with Duchenne, so he'll never reshape his vertebral bodies. It's too late to, to reconstitute the heights of the vertebral bodies, although we can help the patient with back pain and we can help the patient with BMD. But what we understand is that the first osteoporotic event was at six years of age, and you do not need multiples of those tibia or femur or humerus or forearm fractures to say you have a problem in a high-risk setting. Now, we do not like long bone fractures in patients with myopathy because it can take them permanently and prematurely off their feet. So if you're expecting to walk with Duchenne till you're 13 and you have a femur fracture and you stop walking at eight, that's devastating. The other reason we don't like long bone fractures in high risk situations is because they are associated with mortality with the fat embolism syndrome. And this has been reported in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So what's going on here is that when you have a patient who's on steroids and not weight bearing, there's an accumulation of adipocytes in the marrow. Basically the cell lines say, well, we don't really need a lot of osteoblasts here. There's not much going on. This patient isn't walking. So adipocytes form instead. And then at the time of a fracture or even just a bone bruise without any evident fracture on X-ray, those adipocytes are released into the circulation. They coalesce to form fat globules and they shower the lungs and cross the blood brain barrier. And so any patient with a trivial injury like a boy with Duchenne just nicking his elbow on the wall as he turns the corner in his wheelchair or an overt fracture, if they deteriorate respiratory wise or neurologically in the hours that follow, this is FES till proven otherwise, requires steroid stress dosing, intensive care management, and is a cause of mortality. And this has been described in Toronto where four boys died of FES with Duchenne at Toronto Bloorview Hospital in the last uh, decade or so. So just keep in mind that this two or more fractures of the long bones by 10, or three or more fractures by 19, which was put forward by the International Society for Clinical Densitometry to define osteoporosis in kids, was never ever meant for the high risk setting. It was meant for otherwise healthy kids who you're trying to distinguish whether they were unfortunate on the playground versus they have an underlying congenital, usually genetic bone fragility condition. So we assess the skeletal phenotype in detail and we do that even before we look at a bone density. Like I'm, I've hardly talked about BMD by DEXA, right? It really is about the history, the clinical context, how the child is doing overall in the fracture phenotype. So we assess vertebral fractures by asking about back pain. We examine for point tenderness over the posterior spinous processes. We do a lateral spine x-ray. For non-vertebral fractures, we're going on history and physical exam. We look for signs of deformity that can perpetuate or be a sequela of fractures. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. We look for deformity of the extremities that may interfere with weight, weight bearing. And weight bearing is so important. So we have to make sure there's nothing standing in the way of that. And we also look for other signs of morbidity. So rickets, for example, always has to be ruled out. And we look for osteonecrosis in high-risk populations like children with lupus and leukemia. These are the two populations at CHEO where I've seen osteonecrosis in addition to sickle cell disease. I just want to pause and talk about rickets for a moment because it's important to understand that anytime you're worried about the bones in any context, you need to rule out rickets. It doesn't matter if you're an eMERGE doc or an intensivist or a general pediatrician or a subspecialist. If you're looking at a child and you're saying, I'm a little bit worried of the bones here. Always check for rickets first. And I want to tell you about a case that went through a number of specialties at CHEO and then landed in our clinic and had vitamin D deficiency rickets, which is really common. So this is a three and a half year old boy with steroid treated Duchenne. He was referred for a routine bone health evaluation because we see all the boys with Duchenne because of the high risk of fractures. Now, what was interesting was that at three and a half years, he was not walking. 
And with Duchenne, you should walk on steroids till you're 13. That's the average duration of ambulatory status in Duchenne. So not walking at three and a half years of age is very unusual and is a red flag. When he was seen by the bone health clinician, it was noted that he had lower extremity leg pains, which were attributed to the muscle kinds of pains you can get with Duchenne, but x-rays showed rickets. And he had an undetectable vitamin D level, a high PTH, a very high ALKFOS, and a low calcium and phosphate, which is primordial in this condition. So my point is just always think about vitamin D deficiency, always think about rickets. We do that in every patient that you refer. They go for blood work soon after referral, and we make sure we're not dealing with a calcium and phosphate disorder that we need to treat urgently. Because with osteoporosis, you shouldn't have a calcium or phosphate disorder. That's a different entity if you do. Now, this is interesting because Ivan Blasutig contacted me a few weeks ago and Dare McNally as well. I don't know, if Dare, if you're on the call or not, but he uh, wanted to let Dare and I know, because we order a lot of vitamin D levels, that they were raising the lower limit of normal for vitamin D from 12 to 15 animal per liter. And at the same time, Ivan queried Epic and he wanted to see how many vitamin D levels were ordered in the last six months and how many of them are low. So this is interesting. So 2,788 vitamin D levels were drawn on Chio kids in the last six months. 46 were less than 15 nanomole per liter, which is critically low. Less than 30 nanomole per liter is in the rachitic range. So this is a, a, a subset with very low vitamin D levels indeed. Now, fortunately, none of them were in the bone health clinic. So we were happy to hear that because we, we get the kids on vitamin D the moment we know they're low. Um, but these are where the patients were coming from. The ICU, and of course the ICU was very sensitive to the importance of vitamin D sufficiency in the critical illness setting, the outpatient lab, and then on the wards and also the emergency. Now, what concerned me about these data was that Ivan said that most of the kids with these critically low vitamin D levels did not have any follow-up testing. So I don't know whether they were followed up in the community or whether they're still walking around with their critically low levels, but I would invite you to pay attention to vitamin D status to optimize. If you give 3000 IU per liter to someone with an undetectable, sorry, 300 uh, IU per liter daily to someone with an uh, undetectable vitamin D level, you'll bring them up to 75 nanomole per liter. So every 1000 IU per day of vitamin D raises the level 25 nanomole per liter. The other clinical scenario that I want to tell you about that we faced recently is this one. So this is a patient who was five years of age, previously well, who came into the emergency room with excruciating back pain and was admitted to CHEO for an evaluation of vertebral fractures in the back pain setting. He jumped from a one and a half feet tall coffee table, so lower than his own height. So that's a low trauma event. And he struck the hard frame of a couch with his back. He had back pain immediately, rushed to the eMERGE, admitted, noted to have vertebral fractures, and the sort of diagnostic cascade went from there. And I want to say a couple things. And one is that any child with back pain, we need to take that seriously and do an x-ray. Kids should not have back pain. Now, as adults, we often have back pain and it's chronic and we don't need an x-ray to know that we have some mild disc degeneration or slip discs, but kids really shouldn't have back pain and we take this serious. So this was identified in the eMERGE, which is great. When he was admitted, he had URTI symptoms. Now, I want you to know that for us as bone health clinicians, when we see children with vertebral fractures due to the majority of chronic illnesses, they're usually insidious. The collapse evolves over time and the back pain evolves with it insidiously. We don't usually see dramatic acute presentations. When we do, there's one diagnosis we have to rule out and that is leukemia. So this patient, otherwise healthy with back pain, had a CBC that showed that all three cell lines were uh, off. So white cells and red cells and hemoglobin were low, but platelets were high. And this was initially felt to be a reactive rather than proliferative CBC because of the high platelets. ESR was high. So we initially decided to treat his 
back pain with zoledronic acid, but he did not thrive. He continued to have leg pains. And so we pushed for a bone marrow aspirate and he did indeed have leukemia. So keep that in mind that patients with sudden acute onset of back pain or progressive severe back pain over time who are otherwise well, who do not have a notion of any other illness have leukemia till proven otherwise. And so how do we know that he had leukemia? He had no other signs of congenital bone fragility. His sclerae were normal, his teeth were normal. He didn't have short stature, he didn't have skeletal deformity. And again, he had this sort of dramatic presentation. Principle number four is that once an early sign of bone fragility has been identified in an at-risk child, the next step is to determine whether the child has the potential to recover from osteoporosis. So there's a phenomenon called vertebral body reshaping after fractures that's growth mediated, so unique to children. And we look at that closely when we're trying to decide if a child is recovering on their own from osteoporosis or if they need help. And then we also look at BMDZ score trajectories. So let's talk about that. The flagship condition that's associated with the most dramatic potential to reshape vertebral bodies is leukemia. And here I'm showing you a boy who's five, his whole spine is collapsed. He's just been diagnosed with leukemia. This was the hallmark of his presentation with leukemia. And then six years later, seven years later, he has a beautiful spine and has completely reshaped vertebral bodies. In leukemia, there's so much potential to reshape because the children are young when they're diagnosed most of the time, and they have lots of years to grow and reconstitute vertebral dimensions. They're on intermittent steroid regimens, so they're not, whoop, they're not on daily doses, and leukemia is a transient bone health threat for most Here's some more examples. So this is the boy I just showed you in the middle. This is a patient who's a little older and she runs out of time to grow and reshape. And then the patient on the right has a vertebral body that you and I would have if we had a fracture on the ski hill. She was diagnosed with leukemia after she finished growing. She will live with this deformity forever. You can densify that bone. You can have a healing of the bone tissue and your back pain can go away, but you will never reconstitute vertebral bodies once you're done growing. So this is a time sensitive phenomenon. And that's why we're interested in detecting vertebral fractures and treating when we need to, in order to try to restore the normal dimensions of the spine. We know from adult studies that adults with chronic vertebral deformity following fractures have impaired function and chronic pain. Now here's a nice montage I like to show just to demonstrate how long it takes to reshape vertebral bodies, even when the child is really well. This is a little girl with systemic onset JIA. At 18 months, she was on high dose steroids. Cushingoid referred to me, no back pain, grade two fractures coming off her steroids. Growth was improving. We decided to wait and see how she does because she didn't have back pain and she ultimately reshaped, but look at how long it took. It took eight years. So when it looks like patients are gonna run out of time to reshape, we will intervene with bone density altering medications. Bisphosphonates do not make bones grow, but they do reinforce bones so that growth can have a permissive effect on the vertebral body and facilitate vertebral body reshaping. Now patients do not reshape in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The phenotype is too severe. They don't grow well. The steroids are super high dose, long-term, the myopathy is progressive and that vertebral fracture cascade is in motion. This is what the vertebral fracture cascade looks like in someone with persistent risk factors for osteoporosis. It's a boy with Duchenne, he's a beautiful spine at eight. He's on steroids, a year later we do an X-ray, he's got an asymptomatic grade one fracture. Now you may say that looks super trivial, but it just isn't. This is our myocardial infarction, as it is to the cardiologist, this is, a major osteoporotic event or an MOE in a child. Because if you have persistent risk factors, it just progresses. And you can see that's exactly what happened. Two years later, no bisphosphonate therapy, T9 is worse, and now T10 is recruited. If you let that go, he will just collapse his entire spine and de decreases lung volumes in the course of doing so, which concerns me in a disease like Duchenne. So we know that if you have persistent risk factors after vertebral fractures, like ongoing steroids, prolonged immobilization, older age, and an older child in vertebral body reshaping terms is about eight, nine years of age and older, or more severe collapse, you're less likely to reshape. And these are the kids that we target for intervention.
Now, we're finally talking a little bit about BMD, and I want to say that we just don't use BMD diagnostically. We measure it, but we follow it like an infectious disease consultant would follow an ESR. So BMD going up is good. BMD going down is bad. Don't overthink it. And it's best used as a trajectory. So this would be what it would look like in, say, Duchenne muscular dystrophy in the absence of treatment. Things are just going in the wrong direction. So we use BMD by DEXA as a trajectory. We don't put much stock in a single cross-sectional measurement. Obviously, the lower it is, the more concerning. But there's no magic threshold, as I mentioned earlier. So altogether, the approach to how we manage these children is finely tuned to the overall disease trajectory. A child who's thriving, the skeleton's going to follow. A child who's unwell and getting worse, the skeletal health is going to deteriorate. So we divide kids into those with aggressive but transient risk factors for compromised bone health, like leukemia, where most kids will recover, about 80% will recover from osteoporosis. In the inflammatory disorders like rheumatic diseases and Crohn's, it's variable depending on the inflammatory state and the associated steroid use. Fortunately, though, in the inflammatory disorders, I'm not seeing nearly as much steroid. The clinicians are going to biologics much more quickly. And then in Duchenne, there's absent potential for reshaping of vertebral bodies and recovery from osteoporosis. So the child that we target for treatment, the classic candidate would be a child who's older, who doesn't have potential to recover BMD and restitute vertebral bodies, who has persistent risk factors or an unfavorable BMD trajectory. But know that any child, even if they have the potential to recover, if they're sufficiently symptomatic, we would treat them because bisphosphonates are so effective for bone pain. Now, we finally have randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled evidence to support the use of bisphosphonates. We've been using them for like 25 years, but we finally were able to do a placebo-controlled trial um, in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. And I just mentioned this so you know that we do have high-quality evidence now, and you can see that on zoledronic acid, the BMDZ score went up significantly compared to IV placebo. But was, what was of most interest to me in this paper was not that the BMD went up and that the fractures were descriptively better on zoledronic acid, because we already knew that from our clinical practice. It was the adverse event profile. So on zoledronic acid, with the first dose, there were frequent side effects. And we know this. We know that they cause an acute phase sort of inflammatory reaction with the first dose. But 25% on placebo had adverse events with the first dose. And that's a reminder that when we see kids with GI effects or arthralgias or myalgias or bone pain or fever or low calcium, that this isn't always related to the underlying disease or to the um, zoledronic acid, but it may indeed be related to the underlying disease. So just so you know that we do take care of these side effects that can happen with first infusions and we have an on-call approach to doing that. And um, we try to keep these kids out of hospital, maybe about once a year, a child will be admitted because they're having a particularly severe IV zoledronic acid first infusion side effect. So people often say, what about orals? Maybe we'll have less side effects with oral agents. Well, we absolutely do have less side effects with oral agents because the bioavailability is less than 1%. So they're not very potent and they don't do as well from an efficacy perspective. And this is a paper that we have in press that shows that the bang for your buck is much greater on zoledronic acid than oral agents in steroid treated Duchenne in terms of the change in BMD Z score at the spine. So we use IV. Now, one of the things that we see is that the vertebral fractures can progress in Duchenne muscular dystrophy despite anticipatory IV therapy and despite nice increases in BMD Z scores. So here's an example. This is an eight-year-old boy. He has a grade one vertebral fracture on steroids. We start zoledronic acid. He has a beautiful restitution of BMD that was going south, going north. What was it? It was going south before. Now it's going north. And uh, we just titrate the dose to achieve this normal rate of bone and mineral accrual. But here he is nine years later, going off to college, no back pain, happy as a clam from that perspective in terms of his bone health. And he has nice densification of his end plates, but he has some progressive deformity. And this has always bothered me because 
The Zoll did exactly what it should. It increased the BMD. That's what it does. It's a bone density modifying agent. So why do we see this progressive deformity? And then in the context of a clinical trial, I was seeing a lot of full length spines on by the EOS system. And I was reminded that you have hyperlordosis in ambulatory boys with Duchenne and even spondylolisthesis because of this hyperlordosis where L5 slips forward on L1. And I thought, well, maybe this is causing the progressive defor deformity. So we did a little study and we took the children on the STOP study with leukemia, rheumatic disorders, and nephrotic syndrome. And we plotted the distribution of their vertebral fractures. And then we plotted the distribution of vertebral fractures in Duchenne in blue on the top right. And you can see that in the classic steroid treated disorders that thoracic vertebral fractures were most common. But in Duchenne, there was an equal number of relatively thoracic and lumbar fractures, meaning that we were seeing more lumbar fractures than in the classic steroid treated settings. So we thought, well, that's interesting. So this does suggest maybe there's something going on in the lumbar region. And then we looked at the frequency of fractures in the ambulatory phase in Duchenne, which is when the boys are hyperlordotic. And we created something that we call the spinunculus, which is super cute. And it basically describes the frequency of fractures along the length of the spine. And indeed, during the hyperlordotic phase, the ambulatory phase, there were descriptively more lumbar fractures. So I think that in some children that there is an interaction between spine deformity and the propensity for vertebral deformity that cannot be overridden by bone density altering medications. So putting this all together, this is an example of a bone health monitoring paradigm in pediatric GIO or glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. So any child on daily oral or IV steroids should come to our clinic if they've been on it for three or more months. So you refer and you do a we do a baseline BMD and we repeat it every six months until steroid wean then annually. We do spine imaging annually or we do spine imaging sooner if there's back pain or drops in spine BMDZ scores or Cushingoid features or a worsening of disease activity. And we start treatment at the very earliest sign of bone fragility, including grade one vertebral fractures or a single low trauma long bone fracture. And we continue bone protection for as long as the child is on glucocorticoid therapy. So the take home messages here are that we need to be monitoring for bone disease in patients with chronic illness, osteoporosis, steroids and lack of weight bearing are the two main drivers of loss of bone strength and we intervene at the early rather than late signs of bone fragility. And the main risk factors for you to remember are daily oral or IV steroids for three or more months, Cushingoid features, inadequately controlled underlying disease and chronic immobilization. We say if you've been immobilized for a month or more, you're starting to have an increased risk of fractures, whether congenital or acquired. And then poor nutrition and endocrinopathies can augment that. I'm going to finish now just with uh, five minutes of where we're headed from here. So I've just sort of mapped out state of the art. I haven't been able to cover all the diseases, um, but know that the paradigm for thinking about this follows the clinical principles that I just outlined, irrespective of underlying disease. We're really leaning now into Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where the fracture rates are so very, very high. Now, there's a number of approved therapies for Duchenne in the States. The only thing that's approved in Canada is prednisone because we have a totally different drug approval process in Canada. But the point that I want to make is that even these designer genetic and gene therapies are not so robust for clinical outcomes with respect to muscle that we can get away without steroids. So combinatorial therapy, steroids plus exon skipping therapy, steroids plus gene therapy is the way of the future. So we still need to take care of the bones in Duchenne. And people have asked, well, what if we claw back a little bit on the steroid exposure? Can we protect the bones? And the answer is yes, absolutely, but at a cost to muscle strength. So daily deflazacord and daily prednisolone give you the highest fracture risks. And then intermittent 10 days on, 10 days off, give you lower fracture risks, but at a cost to muscle strength, you will stop walking sooner than if you're on daily steroid. And of course at CHEO, we use daily deflazacord or daily prednisone if deflazacord is not available. <clears throat> 
So we have this love-hate relationship with steroids, don't we? And the question is, can we separate the good from the bad? Wouldn't it be amazing if we can retain all the wonderful things that steroids do for patients without giving them the side effects? So there's movement on this question. There is a dissociative steroid that has just been approved by the FDA in October for the treatment of Duchenne called Vomorolone. It retains its anti-inflammatory benefits so it has similar muscle endpoints to daily prednisone after th up to three years, but we don't know if it continues to do well by the muscles beyond three years. And it has some improvement in side effects, growth and bone strength. So this is an interesting compound. So what you need to know is that there's enzymes that are called 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenases that activate steroids from their inactive to their active form, and they're upregulated in the presence of steroids, and they mediate the side effects of steroids. Now, Vomorolone has a lack of an 11-beta oxygen group, and it is not a substrate for these enzymes that potentiate the side effects. So it has less of this transactivation activity, but it retains its trans repression activity, which helps with the inflammation. It's also antagonistic to the mineral corticoid receptor, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Now, there's tons of publications out there on this now, but I wanna summarize what we know and what we don't know from a high level. We know Vomorolone normalizes linear growth. We know it improves bone turnover. We know it reduces, but does not eliminate vertebral fractures. We know that it does not prevent excess weight gain. If you were going to gain weight on Deflazacort, you're going to gain weight on Vomorolone. We know it does not prevent adrenal suppression. And that was very disappointing to me because adrenal suppression is associated with mortality in Duchenne. You cannot stress dose with Vomorolone because it's antagonistic to the mineral acorticoid receptor. And we do not know its equivalence at the adrenal level relative to hydrocortisone. So you have to stress dose with hydrocortisone and nothing else. We don't know if the effect on muscle is similar to daily classic steroids beyond three years. We don't know if it normalizes pubertal development and we don't know if it reduces long bone fractures. So lots to learn here about the Morlone in the Duchenne setting. And this is just a slide to show you um, the fact that the vertebral fractures do look better on Vomorolone. This is after three years of Vomorolone, where the vertebral fracture prevalence was about 13% compared to closer to, 20, to uh, 26 and 29% on prednisone and deflazacort daily, respectively. So what does all this mean in the last minute here um, for the CHEO community? Everything that I've said here, I was saying to Alex, you know, every child has a skeleton. Uh, fractures can happen even in healthy children. Fracture risk is even higher in children with chronic diseases, including pathological fractures, long bone fractures, vertebral fractures. How can we work together to optimize bone health at CHEO? I want to just give you a little bit of history. In 2001, when I came to CHEO, I had just come off training in the genetic basis of bone disorders. So I'd seen children with skeletal dysplasias, bone fragility, and rickets in droves. When I came to CHEO, I continued to see those children, but I saw even uh, more in the secondary osteoporosis realm. And those kids were coming to clinic with profound osteoporosis. So I said to the CHEO community, just send me everybody, whether they fractured or not, if you're worried about them, just send them. Around 2010, we stopped being able to see any child with a risk factor for fractures simply due to volume, because we started to do x-rays of the spine and be tuned to osteoporosis. And we also started to understand the natural history and learn about who we actually needed to see as tertiary care bone disease experts. So now we see children who are ultra high risk before they fractured, like steroid treated Duchenne. And otherwise we see children with chronic illnesses who have had at least one vertebral or long bone fracture. So when to refer to our clinic, if you have a patient who is um, very high risk we want to see them prior to fractures. So that's anybody on daily oral or IV steroids for three or more months. If they're lower risk, so they're not on daily steroids for three or more months, then we want to see them when they've had a single low trauma vertebral or long bone fracture 
So you're going to be surveying patients for long bone fractures, low trauma, falling from a standard height or less. And we would like you to be on the lookout for vertebral fractures. So any child with back pain and a chronic disease, any child with poorly controlled underlying disease, subnormal mobility, or in these contexts with a known association with fractures like leukemia, inflammatory disorders, CP, SMA, these patients we want you to be on the lookout. Ideally, my vision for the future at CHEO would be that we would have a bone health optimization clinic for all at-risk patients, that we would collaborate with a general pediatrician who would want to run that clinic in collaboration with us as bone disease experts, but be responsible for the children before they fractured to optimize those measures that can improve bone strength. And then we would continue as we're doing now to focus on the children who have fractures or are at ultra high risk so that we can continue to move the dial and develop novel therapies to improve bone strength. So your key takeaways are that steroids, malignancy and neuromuscular disorders are the frequent causes of secondary osteoporosis. Remember these four main risk factors that I talked about earlier. Patients on daily steroids for three or more months should be referred to our clinic for anticipatory management. All other patients should be referred following a single low trauma long bone fracture and children with poorly controlled underlying diseases or subnormal mobility or an underlying disorder with an increased risk of fractures should be considered for periodic spine x-rays. And remember that verbal fractures are a bifurcation in our thinking. We take those very seriously. A bone health optimization clinic at CHEO would be welcome and complementary to the work that we do in terms of um, bone disease treatment, Dr. Robinson and I and Dr. Rauch. And if anyone is interested in partnering with us in bone health optimization, I'd be uh, interested in hearing about that. And Vomorolone is a novel dissociative steroid. We need more long-term evidence for what it does and does not do in the Duchenne setting. It's also now being looked at in other disease settings. And remember, if you're an eMERGE doc or an intensivist, you cannot stress dose with Vomorolone. It is a steroid that does require stress dosing, and you have to do so with hydrocortisone. And I'll just say one more thing before I stop talking. I just want to thank my team. There's a wonderful army of people that are behind all of this work, and I really appreciate them. We have some people that haven't made it into this little montage, some new folks that I need to get into our team Zoom photo. And I'm very grateful for the hard work and dedication and commitment of my team. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne, for that really amazing talk. I have to be honest that we had a fire alarm at CHEO during that talk. And so about half of it for the people at CHEO was... Um, hard to hear because of the ringing of the fire alarm, but the fire is clear, thank goodness. So, uh, and hopefully most people were watching from home or did not have a loudspeaker right beside their computer as I do. Um, anyway, is there any questions? I think Dr. McKenzie has promised to have a great question. Yeah, okay, uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, Wardian clarity. You gotta stop giving grand rounds like this because you're gonna keep on asking you, Leanne. But anyway, Amazing distillation. Uh, so uh, uh, just quickly, uh, can you uh, brace the kids with lordosis to get the fractures to get them over a vulnerable point so they don't get the fractures or life is not that simple? Well, that's a, that's a really great question, Alex. And we're starting to really look now at the relationship between biomechanics and what we can do and right. verbal fractures. The problem with bracing is it's just yeah. so uncomfortable. And then if you have Duchenne, yeah. you're unstable and you're trying to walk with a brace. So I don't think yeah. that's a option. What okay. we do, though, Alex, we hope that one day these muscle targeted therapies will be robust enough that the boys will be able to walk erect. Because remember, the lordosis is compensatory, right. just trying yeah. to stay on your feet. And then, of course, we hope one day that we can move away from glucocorticoids so high yeah. dose so long yeah. in due to muscular dystrophy. So that's where right. we're at. That. I've got a ton more questions, but I'll shut up and let other people ask. So I have Rob Klassen with his hand up, and then I have two in the chat that we'll go to right after. Thanks, Leanne. Amazing talk. Very, very nice. Um, I was interested to see that you seem to be very down on DEXA scans. Um, is there any, you basically didn't talk about it at all in your summary at the end. Is there any role for DEXA scans anymore, or when do you use DEXA scans? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, you know, maybe I've come across a little bit too negative because I, I have a deck in everyone. So does Dr. Robinson, Dr. Rauch. 
you know, DEXA, the role of DEXA, Rob, is to really understand the bone health trajectory of the child, which invariably aligns with the clinical trajectory of the child, right? And so when in doubt, having a DEXA is helpful. Now it is influenced by weight gain. It is influenced by short stature. And so, you know, there's a certain expertise that's needed in order to interpret a DEXA. So, I mean, what we tell the CHEO physicians is, I can't really think of a situation where you, as a subspecialist, absolutely need a DEXA. Like if you if you have a child that, you know, doesn't have any fractures, you've checked the spine, there's no long bone fractures, and you're doing a good job of taking care of the underlying disease, that will be reflected in the DEXA. If you have a child where you're really not sure if they're thriving and you're trying to gather more information about that, then a DEXA will be like an ESR, an indicator of how the child is doing overall. So I see it as a real barometer of whether the child is thriving or not. But I can't think of any situations really at CHEO where somebody, a, a non-bone disease physician would have a DEXA and say, okay, now we need to do this, right? That's where Dr. Robinson and I come in and we say, okay, the DEX is doing this, the vertebral fracture phenotype is doing this, the clinical trajectory is doing this, putting that all together, this is the best course of action for this child. Does that make sense, Rob? Like, does that resonate with you? Because I mean, I know you guys order them and I don't want to discourage you from ordering them, but does it influence your management? Well, no, I mean, just because I'm trying to you know, I've been cutting back on them and I'm just trying to figure out whether or not to use them. And then yet you seem to be talking about, you know, vertebral. And I got to admit, I don't do a lot of back x-rays for asymptomatic patients. Obviously, if they got pain, we do back x-rays. So you're saying we sh you're better off doing vertebral x-rays than you are for doing DEXA scans. Exactly. Right. Because it's a bifurcation in our thinking. If you have a vertebral fracture, even a grade one, and I know, as I said, it can look trivial. It is not trivial. You should, if you think about it, you should be able to support your weight above a vertebral level without that vertebral body collapsing. And the vertebral body is designed to bear the weight that's above it. Right. And so if it's compressing, that is overt bone fragility. And for us, it's, as I said, a major osteoporotic fracture, even if it's grade one in children with known risk factors for osteoporosis. So I, we would much prefer that you focus on the spine phenotype fracture wise than the DEXA. If you do do the DEXA, it all, is all about the trajectory, right? So you, you want to look at it over time, know that it can be influenced by height and weight. And, you know, again, that's where some expertise comes in and it's clinical interpretation. Should we do more, Leanne? Should we do them routinely? Sorry, Donna, but should we just do more for the leukemics, et cetera, and not wait, wait for back pain? Well, that's a really good question. So I've worked with oncology in the past, and we have a protocol in place, although I think that there's been turnover uh, with physicians in oncology, and we probably are due for a, a bit of a recalibration. But in oncology, they're supposed to be doing spine x-rays if there's back pain, and 10 years of age and older in the absence of back pain, because if you're actually eight to nine years, it's not 10 years, it's eight to nine years, because if you have vertebral fractures and you're in that peripubertal period, you're going to run out of time to grow and you may need bisphosphonate therapy to reconstitute vertebral bodies. Our goal is for every child to leave childhood with normal vertebral shape. Thanks. We have like one minute and there's two great questions in the chat. So the first from Rada, uh, when would you recommend we do first DEXA scan in a child with CP GMFCS5, only after first fracture or prior to partic in particular circumstances? Yeah, so if a child with CP has had a first fracture, you're going to send that child to the clinic, right? That's a reason for referral. A single vertebral or long bone fracture is a referral to our clinic. And then in terms of DEXA, I would actually prefer you do a spine x-ray. So 25% of patients with motor disabilities in the absence of steroids will have vertebral fractures. And you want to catch the vertebral fractures before the child runs out of time to grow. So I recommend that you do an x-ray by about eight years of age to see if there's vertebral fractures and then repeat it periodically every two to three years thereafter. And if there's no vertebral fractures, and they've lasted through childhood without verbal or long bone fractures, then you have not missed the boat. And we don't treat non-steroid treated disorders in the absence of fractures. So you don't even need to do a DEXA. That's the theme of this round. So, Leanne, thank you for that. So even if they, they're asymptomatic, we should be doing screening x-rays in these kids? 
Yep, because 50% of verbal fractures in children with chronic diseases are asymptomatic. Right. Okay. And then so by eight mm -hmm. years and then every two to three years after that. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And of course, the um, developmental delay population is often nonverbal. So they won't be able to tell you about back pain in the first place. And the thing about back pain is we found this when we did clinical trials that we would ask about back pain and you have to be careful how you ask it. Cause if you say, do you have back pain? They'll think you mean on the day and they'll say no, but you have to say, have you ever had back pain in your life or since the last study visit, et cetera. So it's a tricky endpoint actually. And patients can have back pain for a few days and it can get better. And yet they could have had a vertebral fracture at the time that they were symptomatic and have persistent deformity subsequently. Thanks, Leanne. The last question was from Jason, but he had to drop off. And I think most people are there. Uh, their uh, time is up and we're ready to go to another meeting. So thank you so much for an amazing rounds. Jason's question is a, is a long uh, involved one. So I would invite him. He will have it with you personally, I think, about the clinic. But thank you, Leanne, for an amazing rounds that was really informative and, uh, and super helpful. So thanks, everyone. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye, Leanne. Bye.